If you're someone who is multitasking and you're feeling shame about it, don't. Because look, a time management expert here does as well. And in your, if you're someone who believes it's just a black and white issue, it's not. It's not because that's not how life goes. So what I have developed is a mantra, like a system that will help you understand what to multitask, what not to multitask, so that you don't come up when you've multitasked feeling really frazzled, really stressed. When you think of the word mom, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? We think of the perfect person who gave birth to us and who is capable of handling almost everything. And most of you would agree with me on this, that if anything goes wrong, the first person we think of is our mom. So our moms are supposed to be multitaskers, selfless, perfectionists, and they're always supposed or expected to give their children a priority. They always manage to take out time for everyone except for themselves. And if you are a mom, this episode is specifically for you. Welcome to Coaches on the Couch, the place where experts share their journey and inspire you to take action. My name is Pratish Bhalla and I will be your host for the show. And today we have with us Marisa Lonick, based in the United States of America. She is the mom of four, a wife and an entrepreneur. And she supports women as they juggle across various roles to manage their time, achieve goals, and feel less guilty along the way. Today, she will be sharing with us her story from struggling as a mom, as a working mom, to becoming an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, and a speaker. She would also break the myths around multitasking and self-love. So make sure you stay with us till the end. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. And if you are listening to us on podcast, please go to the Instagram channel Pratishtha Bhalla and leave us a comment. A very warm welcome, Marisa, to Coaches on the Couch. Uh, I remember you mentioned a very interesting term when we were talking before this interview. So let's start with that. You mentioned about time management. Am I saying it correctly? Yes, you are. You are time management. So what is it? Uh, can you can you please tell the viewers? Absolutely. So, you know, when I became a mom, uh, managing my time started to look and feel very different. I definitely felt like I was excelling in wearing lots of hats and keeping lots of balls in the air and juggling all the things for all the people around me right? Like I was able to, uh, my first kids were twins. So I was able to take care of them. I was able to, you know, take care and support my husband in our relationship. I was able to take care of the house. I was able to uh, go to work and grow in my career, but I wasn't putting myself on that to-do list. In fact, if I was putting myself on on the to-do list, it was all the way at the bottom, or it was only when I'd reach a point of feeling burnt out, exhausted, resentful, all the things we feel when we are just go, go, go on the hamster wheel and we're not taking care of ourselves. And I don't think I'm the only mom who felt this way in joining the motherhood community. I think in society in general, you know, moms are taught to be really selfless. Moms are taught to put everyone's needs above their own. Um, It's just kind of what it is when you enter into that world. And I thought to myself, like, this can't be the way to thrive in motherhood. This cannot be the way to do it. You know, I, I'm sure I'm productive. I'm getting things done, but I'm not happy doing it. I'm feeling really unfulfilled. I'm feeling like my own personal goals and dreams. I'm, I'm not, I'm not even sure what those are at this point. And I'm not thrilled with the way life is at this point. And then what happened from there is then I started to feel guilty. Why would I feel why would I feel like sad about this? I have everything I always wanted, right? I have a family, I have a job, I have a home, I have these things. What's going on? Why am I feeling this way? So, it really got me to thinking about 
when you enter motherhood, how your time management skills, you know, they're wonderful. And of course you need to be organized. You need to be productive. You have lots of things you're taking care of, but you also need to kind of flip the script a little bit and momage your time, not manage it, which means prioritizing yourself, your needs, your goals, your dreams into your day so that you can show up as the best version of yourself. You can live your best life as a mom and as a woman. So Marisa, as you're saying, prioritizing yourself. So a lot of women who are listening, they might be thinking, what are you talking about? I don't have time to breathe. So leave away time, managing time for myself. So when you were thinking, when you were in the middle of that frustration, how did you navigate through? Like, what was your first step? Yeah. So the first thing I did was I took a really scary leap. And what that was, was at the time I was in a corporate space working in a corporate leadership position and I was offered uh, a promotion, an opportunity to move up in the company. And my first thoughts that came to mind were, yes, this is so exciting. I am thrilled with this opportunity. I'm an ambitious woman. This is what I've been working toward. Absolutely. And then fear and doubt and guilt started to creep in. And I started thinking to myself, I started talking myself out of this opportunity, thinking, hey, it's probably not a good idea. You have to move across country. What are you going to do? You don't have the support systems in place or you are going to be working longer hours, commuting more days per week. Um, that where are you going to find the time to do this? You don't want to be the type of mom who's not present at home, who's never there. And all, all of these feelings of like, you shouldn't do this started creeping in. And at first I listened to them. And at first I actually turned down the opportunity. And for, I turned it down on a Friday. And for that weekend, I was plagued with regret. I was just filled with a feeling that did not sit well. And I talked to my husband who was extremely supportive at the time. And I was like, I don't know what's wrong, but I just feel so terrible about having made this decision. And I had, you know, really thought about it. I had written out the pros and cons and really analyzed this. And I'm a, I'm a big head thinker. So I really dissected this and, you know, we just talked about it and he's like, well, why don't we just try it? And I was like, you're right. Nothing's permanent. Let's try it. And I did. And what happened was when I ended up taking that leap and taking that new position, you know, across the country, moving my family, all the things I realized that even though on paper, I appeared busier, even though on paper it appeared I had less time, less hours at home or less hours to do this or that, I felt so differently about my life. I had a fulfillment that I was lacking because I was going after, you know, a personal and professional goal. I was able to really level up how I was managing my time with intention. So I was making the most out of all the hours I had with my family, I was extremely efficient in the office. I was able to really maximize my organization skills. I was able to implement some new systems in place that quite frankly, I wouldn't have had the motivation or even the creativity to do prior. And I realized like, Hey, this is something that I think all moms need to understand is you can absolutely still go after what you want. You can absolutely still prioritize your needs, your dreams, your goals without sacrificing all these other things. In fact, it can get better. All of those things can get better. So I hear you that you were juggling across different things and you mentioned a word, uh, level up with intention. So how does one level up with intention? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, the first thing you need to do when you want to be intentional about how you use your time is you need to know how you want to use it. <laughs> so if you don't have that clarity, if you don't know what you're working toward, what's important to you, what your values are, what's going to happen. Anytime you get a lull in your day, some free minutes here, free time there. And no matter how busy you think you are, you get those moments throughout the day. We all get them. We have to. So when you get that time, if you don't have the clarity of what you're aiming for or the clarity in your values and all of those things, 
you can't possibly use that time with intention. You end up filling it with garbage. You end up doing things that get you nowhere. And that's what I'm talking about when you're like mindlessly scrolling social media. I'm, I'm on social media. I'm a fan of social media, but I use it with intention, right? I don't let social media control me. I control it. Or you end up having to numb out and watch some um, bad reality TV or just something that's going to make you feel like you can just disconnect from everything because you're feeling so burnt out, right? So this is what I mean when, when I say use your time with intention. Like it's not to say that we all shouldn't allow ourselves that time to rest and relax and recharge or whatever it is. But when you're using any free pocket of time you have with things like that, you're not moving the needle anywhere on where you want to be because you don't even know where you're going. Yeah, when we are on the social media and we just uh, start scrolling and then there is a video 20 minutes later, like, oh, 20 minutes have passed, I have to go back to work or the child is again crying, I have to look at them. It happens so often. But um, when I talk to people, they say, so don't I need to have my cool time? Uh, when I'm scrolling, I forget my troubles. So if they have to just forget their troubles, is there a better way to deal with it? instead of yeah scrolling. absolutely so there's nothing wrong with wanting to rest and recharge and relax and disconnect from the hustle and bustle of everyday life in fact it's something you should be doing every day but i think people people often confuse that those moments of sort of like that escape um, with the, so, like with the mindless scrolling of social media, because even though you're, t you're quote unquote, escaping what you have to deal with in that moment, how do you feel after you've done that for 20 minutes? You know, ask yourself that because oftentimes you don't feel recharged. You don't feel rested. You don't feel like you were able to fully disconnect and now you're ready to get going and motivated. You feel like crap. You feel like that because you've been watching all of these other highlight reels, these people's not real life on social media, and you start to feel bad about yourself. You get comparisonitis. So you think, oh my gosh, look at all those things this person's doing. I haven't done anything with my day today. I feel terrible about myself. Or you look at someone else's super clean house and you're like, oh, I should have used those 20 minutes to do laundry or clean the kitchen. And now you feel bad about yourself. So, you know, if you want to use social media to disconnect, totally fine. But if you're coming out of those scroll sessions feeling like this, that's not the medicine you need in that moment. Yeah, I think that is so common. Uh, they uh, like we get on a guilt trip. Oh, my God, I wasted my 20 minutes. I could have used it otherwise. So in that moment, it's uh, if we have an intention of getting things done, that would help them, as you said. So how can they start with putting these intentions at the right place at the right time? Absolutely. So the first thing you want to do is you want to get everything out of your head and onto a piece of paper. So you can call this a brainstorm. You can call this a brain dump. You can call this whatever it is, but you would be surprised if you thought about the fact that like, and I'm sure you've had this experience. I'm sure your listeners have. You've got so many things floating around your head and it feels disorganized. It feels cloudy. It feels foggy. And when you get those moments of free time, you don't even know where to start or what to do because they're all just jumbled up in there and you have no idea and it's overwhelming. And so what do you do? You get analysis paralysis where you don't even want to do anything because it's so, so many top thoughts jumbling through your head and you decide to self-medicate with something that's more instantly gratifying, like not doing the task, like scrolling social, like doing a time wasting activity, we'll call it. So getting everything on paper is the first step. Get it all out of your head and all on paper. Now this should be stuff you have to do, tasks. This should be stuff you want to do that you never feel like you don't have time, that you always feel like you don't have time to do. It should be a mix of all the things, right? And then the biggest mistake people make from here is they take that big hot mess list because it can be very lengthy, right? If you've ever done this really and gotten every single thing out of your head in that moment and it takes you, you know, not that long, 10 to 15 minutes, but it can be really, really a long list. 
The mistake people make is that they just start diving in and trying to accomplish things and cross them off the list. And they realize even though they've been, they've done so much of that stuff, which feels good at the end of the day, they look at the list and they're like, oh my gosh, but there's so much more left. Or I have to add even more to this. It feels like it's growing rather than shrinking. And so what I recommend is take a look at that list. And before you actually dive into it, prioritize the three things for the day that you are going to get done. Three things, circle them, highlight them, do whatever you need to do. And those are the three things when you get those pockets of time that you go directly to and you fill that time and energy and space with. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, that sounds like an action plan so much easier. First, put it, dump it on a paper and then prioritize only three things instead of thinking of these, this is left, that, that is left. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's difficult to narrow down to three things, especially I think when you don't have a support system and you have to manage your household chores, your kids, husband, work, everything. So in those moments, how to give the priority? Because I think children would always be priority number one <laughs> because they're yeah. dependent. But for the remaining two, how do we decide on just three? Well, you have to hone it down, right? You have to break it down because again, if you have too many priorities for the day, you're going to get that sense of overwhelm creep in and you're not going to you're not going to be able to hold yourself accountable to anything. So the bottom line is you start with three and then when you get three done, if you feel like you have more time, more energy, more space to complete more, great. And if you don't, at least you know what you set out to do, you've completed. There's just no argument there. Like there's no, should I do this or this? It's, it's really simple and straightforward in front of you. Now, as far as support systems go, I want, I want to comment on that because I think a lot of people tend to, tend to make excuses. And I don't mean this in a bad way. Excuses are valid, especially in motherhood. We deal with a lot of challenges, but there's always a creative way to solve a problem. There's always a creative way to solve a problem. And so if you're thinking your support system is you don't have one because maybe your partner doesn't really help you around the house, or maybe you don't live near family, or maybe you don't have the means to hire support or delegate out and outsource some tasks, I want you to stop right there and I want you to think creatively about this. Because where there's a will, there's a way. You can do this, right? We've all been in complicated problems, situations before. And when we actually stop and give ourselves the time and space to just think, we can usually come up with a solution. So just some quick ideas that come to mind. First and foremost, with your partner, are you communicating what you need effectively? Are you asking specifically for what you need or are you giving a really generic statement and then feeling resentful that your partner is not helping you? So are you saying things like, I wish you'd help me clean the house or are you saying things like, hey, it would be so helpful if you could wash the dishes after dinner tonight? Super duper specific, right? Secondly, I think we underestimate our kids. Kids as young as two years old are ready to help you. Now, I'm not going to tell you that my two-year-old can sweep the floor as well as I can, but the fact that I am instilling the quality of him being a helpful member of the family at home, of him having jobs in the home, I think is from a bigger picture perspective going to help us much more in the long run. And also it is, it is helpful. Honestly, I have kids that range in ages from eight to two, you know, there are definitely things that my older kids, even my middle son can help with at home. And so just, you know, allowing yourself to not get caught up in sort of that perfectionism of, oh, it's not going to get done the way I want it, or it's going to take so much longer. Let me just do it. You are instilling incredible qualities in your kids when you're able to receive help and support from them and delegate some tasks to them. Uh, when it comes to investing in help, right, outsourcing things, you know, really, I want you to think creatively about this. So when I first moved to the West Coast from the East Coast, I didn't have much support around. 
And one of the things that I thought about was how can I get more childcare on a weekend here or there? Because I had childcare taken care of for when I went to work, luckily, but I didn't have it here and there on the weekend when I wanted to just kind of go on a date with my husband or do something fun that wasn't in the typical routine of working mom life. And so I had joined a community of moms, a mom's club in the area. And I pitched, hey, let's come up with an exchange program where we kind of form these little smaller groups and we each, you know, rotate dropping our kids off at your house or my house, or if there were three of us rotating amongst the three of us. And we all just kind of host a play date once in a while. And then the rest of us get to go out and do what we need to do, whether that's run errands, hang out with our spouses, hang out with friends. And so many women responded that this was such a great idea because either they didn't have the funds to make this investment or they didn't trust a lot of people to be with their children, especially if they were the ones solely taking care of them. And it ended up being a really great solution for many people. So I think if you can really just sit there and sort of think creatively or get yourself some resources, this is in my book, Time Management, think ideas like this, you know, then you can really sort of think outside the box as to how that support could be around you and you just haven't tapped into it. I think uh, you gave some really nice and unique ideas. Uh, I really like the last one when you're saying that exchange with other moms because that way your child is safe uh, and they can trust, you can trust each other and also enjoy time with um, with your family or, like, or do something you really like to do. You mentioned about being perfectionist. Like I see that all the time. Uh, even my mom, she wants things to be the way, like perfect. If if she's delegating, she'll uh, sometimes come and say, no, this is not what I told you to do. And I see a lot of women doing this, like they give some work to the husband or come give a complaint that you are not doing the work. And when he's trying to do, you are telling you are not doing it <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> so it never yeah. gets done and you end up like doing everything yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely something many women face. And, you know, I think the self-awareness is a really good first step of just realizing like, hey, it's not everyone else doing a bad job. It's me needing to relinquish some control here, right? So you could either decide to take all ownership and responsibility and feel resentful afterwards, or you could decide to get, delegate some of that and feel good. And I don't know about you, but I like to feel good. So, yeah, um, you talked about a very uh, important point. It is about feeling good and taking control. And I think that is somewhere related to self love. And I think self love is uh, still a unique, like, not a very, um, like, not some, something everybody knows about how to practice self love. So, for a mom specifically, if they want to practice self-love, sometimes they are made guilty, made to feel guilty with the people around. So in the, that case, how can a mom be actually uh, practicing self-love as well as not feeling guilty when uh, others are like trying to tell her that this is not good, you have to post prioritize the kids? Yeah, thank you for asking that question because I think it's a it's a taboo topic that a lot of moms are afraid to talk about. And what really changed for me in how I view this point, because I definitely was a victim of, of, you know, the societal kind of pressures and all of those things. And I know many moms fall into that trap of putting themselves last and really playing the martyr and all of those things is I want you to think about this from the perspective of you parenting. So when you parent your kids, I imagine you tell them you love them all day long. Like you express that love in so many ways, whether it's in what you're doing for them in verbally saying it and giving them hugs and kisses and all the ways. Right. And I would think they feel loved from you in doing so. Now we're raising kids, obviously they're kids, but we're raising them to be adults. We're raising them to be thriving, independent adults one day. And when I thought about the fact that I was modeling 
a way of being so selfless and then showing up as like not a good version of myself after all of that, I was like, oh my God, these kids are going to repeat this cycle if I don't change something fast. If I don't teach them how to love themselves by modeling this in myself, what, what could happen here? Like it could be a disaster. They could just repeat this cycle. It could just not end well. And I just couldn't grasp the fact that they might grow up one day and repeat this cycle. I didn't want this to happen. I love them with such an infinite amount of love. I wanted them to love themselves in that same way. And so that is when I really shifted my perspective of not letting guilt, not letting pressures, not letting all of these things get in the way of me taking care of myself and putting my own needs and goals um, front and center in order to show up well for them. Yeah, I think and um, uh, as parents, it is a responsibility that uh, we take care of ourselves so that the children, when they face the similar problems as adults, they know what to model. So they don't end up in a wrong cycle. I think that's a very uh, profound thing you shared. Was there anyone who brought that to your notice? Or what made, was there any moment that made you realize that this is happening and you need to change? Yes. Can I share a quick story about it? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. So back a few years ago, I got an evite, an invitation in my email to participate in something called Mom's Day Away. And what this was, was a group of moms that I didn't know that well, but I had a friend of a friend of a friend, right? Had organized this day. I live in California in the U.S., not far from wine country. And they had organized a day where they'd rent uh, a party bus and we'd all go up to a few vineyards, do some wine tasting, you know, get some lunch together and just really enjoy this day together. All just moms having fun and then, you know, come back home. Now at the time I was the corporate executive. I was commuting almost every day, an hour plus to my house. You know, I, my weekends were really sacred with my family. I would spend that time connecting with them, doing fun things with them. I would spend that time kind of getting things in order in the house, you know, food shopping, laundry, all the things. And you know how weekends go when you're a working parent. So I got this invitation. And while at first I was like, yes, that sounds awesome and amazing. What happened? I let the mom guilt creep in. I let myself start spiraling and thinking similar to that other situation I shared of saying like, no way, I can't waste a whole Saturday doing something like this. Like I have so many other responsibilities to take care of, or I should be spending this time with my family. Like my kids only see me a few hours in the evening every day. Like this is really selfish of me. Or uh, why would I drop all this money on a day like this? You know, like, is it responsible to do that? I could be using it in a different way to support my family or saving it for my kid's college or anything like that. And I did an RSVP for a long time. In fact, I got called out because I didn't RSVP by the date to be like, hey, are you coming or not? So finally, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to go. It sounds super fun. My husband was really supportive. He's like, just go. It sounds like a great day. And I did. And what I realized was when I went on this, you know, mom's day away was, hey, of course it was really fun. Of course it was nice to like recharge with other moms. But the most important takeaway from that day was, I showed my kids that when they're invited to something that sounds really fun and exciting, they should go just like I went. They shouldn't think of 101 reasons why it's not a good idea because I want them to have those fun experiences. I want them to, you know, have those friendships, those connections, those beautiful sceneries they can see, all of those things. And if I'm not modeling that, how can they possibly decide to do that on their own? I think that's a great self-realization uh, because uh, most of us never get out of that cycle. You're thinking, oh, how can we just spend that time or that money on ourselves because it is supposed to help our kids more or it is supposed to be for the family. But just taking that small time out uh, can, can help uh, our children learn in a better way. 
i also want to understand about something a little different about multitasking yes <laughs> so uh, as uh, women are always juggling across different things and trying to do multitask uh, there is also some signs around that if you are multitasking you are not being very productive but then there are some people who say you need to multitask what do you believe and why yeah i'm so glad you asked this question because i every time i ask any of my clients or any of my instagram followers or anybody in my in my world i say hey do you multitask and the the answer i typically get is like a very very shameful yes <laughs> people are often really embarrassed to say they do this because most experts out there are going to tell you hey don't multitask I'm sure mm -hmm. you've heard this before. I've heard it dozens of times. I follow a lot of really successful, really insightful, really impactful entrepreneurs and just professionals out there. And so I take their value, their opinion, you know, to heart. I really, I see the value in what they're saying, because ultimately when you are multitasking, what are you doing? You're, you're splitting your brain between two, three, four things, and you're not giving your full attention to anything at hand. So I get where they're coming from. I understand. Yet I'm a mom of four kids. I run a business. I manage a house here. I, you know, used to be a corporate executive on top of all of this. And I really just keep it real. I mean, I have to multitask in my house to keep a roof over our head sometimes and just keep things moving, get us to school on time, all of the things. So I want to preface this with saying, if you're someone who is multitasking and you're feeling shame about it, don't because look, a time management expert here does as well. And in your, if you're someone who believes it's just a black and white issue, it's not, it's not because that's not how life goes. So what I have developed is a mantra, like a system that will help you understand what to multitask, what not to multitask so that you don't come up when you've multitasked feeling really frazzled, really stressed, or make mistakes or drop the ball, or, you know, feel like you're just in a whirlwind of doing a hundred things, because often we feel like that when we're multitasking. And on the opposite end of that, you don't feel like you're not able to get all of the things done that you need to do every day because you're just totally avoiding it. So I think there's a happy medium there. And what that is, is deciding specifically what you multitask and what you don't. And my mantra that I've created around this is this. It's really simple. I would recommend you write it down. You multitask the mindless and you solo task the mindful. So let's just exemplify that for a moment. So you want to think about all the things that you're doing on a regular basis that you can do on autopilot. Things you can do with your eyes closed, things that if you messed them up, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And when I think of this from like a mom life perspective, but probably just from a general perspective too, I think of things around the house. I think of things like, you know, washing dishes. I think of things like folding laundry. I think of things even like exercising, if I'm, you know, can do that safely while doing something else, because I don't know about you, but my mind is often in 10 other places when I'm exercising, right? Like I'm usually not focused on the treadmill and running because I know I want to get off quicker also if I'm doing that. So I recommend you multitask those mindless activities and you pair them with something that maybe brings you some joy in those moments, especially if they're tasks you don't love doing. I don't love folding the laundry, but now I will pop in a podcast or I will pop in an audio book or I will call a friend who I want to catch up with and do that. And the task will feel like it's over in five minutes, right? And I've gotten now more than one thing done that I've wanted to do that day. Um, now on the opposite end of that, I want you to solo task the mindful. These are the mistakes people make when they multitask the wrong things and they have those really negative consequences of feeling burnt out, frazzled, stressed, like they're just waiting for the shoe to drop. These are the things that if you mess them up, they would take a lot of effort to clean up or that when you're not fully present for, you don't feel good about. They're important to you. So these are things like when you're connecting with family during dinner time, you know, you're not checking your email or checking your social on your phone. You're actually having a conversation with these people, right? Or these are things like 
working on a work project or creating something in your business. You want to be fully focused and engaged and not toggling between 17 tabs and answer, answering emails in between or you know, picking up your phone as it rings. You want to be in the zone because those things slow you down and those things make you not be able to fully execute these ideas, these really good downloads you're getting and be able to really work in your zone of genius. I think that's a very good tip. Now, now I'm realizing, okay, it's okay. When, because whenever I'm doing something with the in the household, like cooking or something, I always have my training or something on that I'm always listening to. Good um, job, yeah. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think it works. Uh, what you are saying works uh, a lot. If you are uh, doing something which is just does not require that much attention, you can always do something which is also productive so that you can enjoy the time with the family. Otherwise you will do mindless things as one task, then you will go and learn or like execute your business. And then you won't be able to spend time with the family. I think that's a great tip, tip uh, when it comes to having a work-life balance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. So uh, to conclude for today's session, I would ask you what are your three secrets which are making you glow today? <laughs> My three secrets that are making me grow? No, uh, I'm asking glow. You are glowing. <laughs> so oh, glow, you. glow. Okay. Well, I, you know <laughs> what? I'm more change... forward and I see so, like you, uh, you have maintained yourself so well and you have so many great ideas and I can see a glow on your face. So just gotcha. share with us the secrets. Okay, okay. I like, <laughs> I, I kind of like to interchange grow and glow too because I think when you're growing, you are glowing. So that's one thing I'll say is I'm always looking to develop myself and learn and grow professionally and personally. And I think that does come off in kind of how I'm able to speak, how I'm able to look, act, all of the things. So that's for sure. Investing in yourself is really, really, really important, whether that means, you know, purchasing that course, working with that coach, you know, getting a personal trainer, like whatever that means to you, invest in yourself. You are your biggest asset. Um, so that's one thing. You want three tips? This is pressure. Okay. Uh, another thing I don't thing want to is, give you pressure, but if you can, I think the first yeah, is amazing. I'm, I, it's okay. You're I'm getting amazing it. content out from you. Some, sometimes I work well under pressure. Sometimes I don't. I'm going to use it for the positive today. Okay. Um, another thing I will say is get yourself a good morning routine. So whether that is five or 10 minutes long or 30 or 45 minutes long, or even longer, do what you can, but have a consistent morning routine. I think this is really, really important. You always have time for the things you put first. So even if it's something really small, like meditating for five minutes in the morning or journaling or a quick workout that you can get in or even hydrating. Hydrating is a big deal, honestly. Something that simple that you can create a habit of doing every single morning, I think is gonna take you so much further. So get a little bit of a morning routine in place if you don't already have one. Um, I have a whole podcast episode on my best morning routine tips if you wanna check that one out. And the third tip, ooh, that keeps me glowing. I, I have flipped the script in sort of my relationship with time. So I used to believe that I didn't have time. I used to say these words out loud often day in and day out. I used to feel very busy all the time. I used to turn down things that I really wanted to do because I felt like my schedule was already so full. I couldn't make it happen. And when I flipped my mindset on this and started believing that time is abundant, that there's always enough time for what I need to do and want to do, and I get to prioritize how I use my time, I am in control of that, everything changed. Everything changed. So if you find that you're kind of a victim to time, if you find that you're treating time sort of like this enemy in your life, this scarcity in your life, flip the script on that. Maybe stop saying the words, I don't have time and start replacing those words with, it's not a priority to me. 
and you'll see a, an immediate shift. So if I can exemplify this really, really fast. So if, if exercise, for example, is something you find yourself saying, I don't have time to exercise. I used to say this a lot. And all of a sudden you switch that, those words with exercise isn't a priority to me. Something changes. And in my opinion, either way you feel is a win. So if you feel like, well, you know what? It's just not, it's not a priority right now in this season I'm in or what I'm up to, or I'm really focused on this and I can't be focused on that. And you just feel a weight lifted. You feel less guilty. You feel less shame. You feel like you are in control of how you're using your time, what you're prioritizing. And it's a win. Now, on the other hand, if that doesn't make you feel good when you say that out loud, because in fact, your health, your wellness, your exercise, your weight loss, whatever it is, is a priority to you. Oof, that doesn't feel good to say those words out loud. So you decide to do what? To make it a priority, right? So you shift some things around in your schedule. You wake up a little earlier. You go to sleep a little later. You use your lunch hour for this or whatever it is. You invest in a new gym and you make it a priority. You propel yourself forward to do that. It's like a fire you ignite. So if you can kind of flip your script and your mindset around time in that way, I think you will notice immense benefits. Wow. Uh, so we got the three tips. I'll just summarize in one line. When you gl- grow, you glow. I really like that line. <laughs> and yes. you mentioned about having a great morning routine and time is in abundance. And I, as you're saying, I'm realizing that we never say time is in abundance. We are always program to believe we have limited time and time is never in abundance so that is a very a big perspective change that the moment i say i have enough time only this is not a priority that is a time the shift happens thank you so much marisa for sharing amazing content amazing tips with the audience here with me as well i learned a lot today thank you everyone for staying with us till the end if you enjoyed this episode Make sure you write a comment to us so that we know that you are enjoying these sessions. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop it in the comment box. I will be sharing all the links of Marissa in the comment box as well as the description section of this video. So make sure you check her out. And if you would like to work with her, just get connected. I'll meet you in the next episode with another amazing coach. Till then, keep smiling and keep shining. It's me, Pratishtha Bhalla. Bye-bye.